Welcome and thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar, Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, and our distinguished guests your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV and we'll do our best to answer, to answer you. Uh, it's my uh, privilege to introduce my co-host. He's the CEO, founder of Constellation Research, best-selling author of Disrupting Digital Business, regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, ZDNet, CNBC, Fox Business, and all the major media outlets that, that you follow. And in my humble opinion, one of the top futurists on Twitter, at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray Wong, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm lucky to be here with my co-founder, co-host of Disrupt TV show, Vala Afshar, one of the top followers on Twitter for both CMO, CIO, Sage Advice, and as well, a TV celebrity himself. But more importantly, we're here to talk about fun people who are here on the show. So I randomly bumped in again at the Adobe Summit and just hanging out. So who do we have on stage? What do we have next? Our first guest is someone who I have been following religiously for several years on Twitter because he's not only a digital, social, emerging technology expert, but he really is uh, an, an incredible person that shares uh, his, his leadership uh, principles uh, very regularly on Twitter. David Armano is Global Strategy Director at Edelman. David is a seasoned business brand and digital transformation strategist who helps brands uncover and activate their higher purpose, which we're gonna talk about, for both business and societal impact. Dave serves as Global Strategy Director for Communications and Marketing Firm Edelman. He helps organizations build brands in an increasingly digital, connected, and real-time business environment. He focuses on the intersection of strategy, creativity, and business, directing a multidisciplinary teams who deliver world-class brand experiences uh, which integrate and operate at scale. He's worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, and we'll talk about that hopefully in the next 20 minutes. He's an active voice, not just on Twitter, but on Adweek, on Forbes, and major media outlets. So someone who actually creates these incredible visual illustrations to bring concepts to life. A great follow on Twitter, at Armano, A-R-M-A-N-O. You can tell from the Twitter handle, one of the early adopters. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, David, to uh, Disrupt TV. Vala, Ray, thank you both. That was quite the introduction. Uh, wow, um, I, I feel honored to be here. And uh, Ray, it was so great to run into you at the Adobe Summit. Um, I want to know your secret because you look uh, like you don't age at all. I'm you look exactly <laughs> the same as you did uh, 10 years ago, like no change whatsoever. So after <laughs> this, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on your beauty secrets. I, I, I want the, the, best, the best hair in technology, hands down. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't move. It works great in convertibles. But hey, you know, I, I do want to thank you. I mean, nine years ago, we started our company, Constellation Research. We had this awesome conference set up. It was called Connected Enterprise. We did it in Scottsdale. And you agreed to come and speak. And I really want to thank you because that talks to your generosity. You have no idea what we're doing, what we're up to. We're just kind of in the social space. I just well, quit I like another Ray. company. I like Ray. I'm going to go. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and hopefully you had a great time. I remember you came out and it was wonderful. But hey, you know, you guys are doing a lot of interesting things at Edelman. You guys just finished this global earned brand survey. You figured out six in 10 consumers consider themselves belief driven buyers. Like what's a belief driven buyer? And more importantly, you hit something very interesting around where purpose and what that means today or doesn't even have any meaning. Let's start there and talk about this uh, temptation to co-op culture as a way for brand to become relevant. Yeah, look, I, so we have we have, we have two pieces of research that I think are actually telling two sides of a related story. So we have Trust, trust Barometer, yep. which um, is, I think, going into its 17th year, and it's very well known. And we, you know, one of the macro findings, and, and this does not come as a surprise, uh, and this is a global study, so it's not just the U.S., but we found that one in, in, one in six, uh, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> only one out of six people actually feel like the system is working for them. And so by the system, that is described as those are the bureaucracies, that is government, those are um, your, your financial institutions. So, um, and that's, that's, that's really at like a global level. So that's telling us something. That's telling us that people feel like um, there are systems that are not fair. I think that um, there may be a president who was elected that talked about a rig system. So that may have resonated. Um, so that might not come as a shock, but the data does support that. So what happens when people feel like uh, you know, the system's not working for them or the system is rigged. Uh, well, our other study actually tells us, and you hit on this, Ray, um, you know, we have, uh, we have 
uh, stats that actually tell us that that almost half the people that we talked about actually think that um, sort of private organizations, i.e. brands or companies, or how we want to re refer to them, are, are better equipped to solve societal issues than where you would normally expect to see them, um, you know, i.e. I, I governments. Like governments, yeah. Right. So, so, so these are the macro dynamics that we're seeing, and, and there's a lot more depth there, but I think that's sort of the top line, is that you have people that are sort of saying, you know, if, it, if the system is rigged, or I don't trust the bureaucracies, or, you know, Congress is ineffective, like we look at our, you know, things in the U.S., which has been like that, you know, the gridlock that we have in this country, they're going to look for alternative uh, sources. Now, you take that, and you compound that with two other dynamics. One, millennials, huge generation, have always been belief-driven buyers, right? There's, it, it's not a surprise that when you do millennial studies and you look at the top brands, brands like Patagonia, for example, go to the very top. Right, you know, great example of a brand that really operates off its off its values, and no no company or brand is perfect, but they're they're pretty close in terms of like living, you know, walking the walk. And uh, by the way, it's not just in their actions; it's also in in their marketing. And then we'll we'll get into that. Um, so you have millennials who have always felt like that, and then you have um, a, a very politically charged and polarized um, world that we've now moved into. So you add those dynamics to the cauldron of everything else I just talked about. And that's where we're at, right? So, um, you know, really you're seeing this confluence of, of uh, what companies say they believe in and the values that they say that they uh, espouse and operate on. And consumers are taking a closer look at that and it's influencing their decisions um, in terms of if they want to buy, if they stay loyal, um, you know, how much they advocate for them, all the above. Wow. So, so so can you talk a little bit more about what is purpose-led brand development? You mentioned brand, you, talk, you, you mentioned purpose. I've watched your TED Talks for years. You've been giving guidance on social media in terms of having a purpose and being able to engage in a meaningful way. So can you talk about how you and Edelman help clients navigate these waters around brand purpose. What do you advise CEOs? I mean, you've worked with companies like Adidas. I mean, the brands that you work with are the top 100 brands in the world. So how do you help them develop yeah. this purpose-driven brand mindset? Well, that's a great question. Um, so to try to, <laughs> sometimes you have to oversimplify things a little bit yeah, that are sure. really complex. And um, there's two halves of this picture that are not new. And that's important to understand. So, um, you know, I went and I found a, a talk by, uh, uh, by Steve Jobs that must have been close to 25 years old. And he was talking about the purpose of Apple and, and how it is really meant to inspire and empower essentially the creative class. And I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing. And that's always really that you've been core to what Apple does. Even today, the fact that you know, look at the creators, so you, 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 they are using a lot of, I mean, the phones, the software, a lot of what Apple puts out there and it makes it very um, easy and it democratizes that. So you can look from the perspective and you could say, you know, brands sort of that operate off a higher purpose, that is not a new thing. Okay, now on the other side, um, so in the world of communications uh, um, that comes right down from the CEO, Vala, you working for Salesforce, that's very active in this space, you, 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 this is not going to come as a surprise to you. Um, so we have this acronym that we use, corporate social responsibility in the world of communications. And you know, those are, those are the things that a company does to sort of give back, right? To do good in their community, to do good for society. Um, it, all the programs, um, uh, sustainability is a part of that, uh, community outreach is a part of that, um, you know, all of those things. And that is typically owned by the CEO and, and their communication team. Okay, so now you have the world of sort of higher order brand purpose, as, as I sort of described, a la the Apples, and by the way, the Nikes of the world, they've all really done a good job of sort of saying, this is why we exist. And then you have this sort of world that says, you know, we are not just an organization that's interested in profit, we are going to give back. And that has been traditionally fine as CSR. Those two worlds are colliding and coming together um, in sort of a new way. And that's the new thing. So when you hear um, organizations talking about wanting to be more purpose-led or purpose-driven and it a actually having to come across in every part of the consumer experience. And I use Patagonia as an example. That's, you know, they're kind of an outlier in a way, actually. A lot of 
a lot of CMOs, a lot of CEOs, not CIOs probably, that's a different story, but they would look at a company like that and go, you know, that's the model. And I would say that's a good aspiration, but they're an outlier. But the reason why you would look at a company like that is because when you walk into a Patagonia, you feel, you feel the values of the company, you feel the purpose, you see it. When you read the headlines, you see it, you feel it. When you interact with employees, um, it, you know, if you do, when you actually buy the product, when they're telling you don't buy our product because actually <laughs> buy a used product because that's good for the environment, it all comes together. And consumers don't make that distinction. They don't make the distinction between, okay, what are you doing on the corporate side and what are you doing when you're marketing to me as a brand and what are you doing, you know, when I'm walking into a Chick-fil-A, for example, which is actually a values-based business and people are like, I've never seen such a clean QSR. I've never had such friendly customer experience. So these worlds are coming together and brands are grappling with how they come together. So the way we help them is we help them break down their silos between the, the, the marketing side and the communication side. We help them um, you know, ensure that they're not just going to uh, uh, do a marketing stunt, um, that their values are actually going to be in it. You know, when you look at what Gillette did not that long ago, um, okay, caught people's attention, started a conversation, but where's that conversation today? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we talk about in terms of co-opting culture. So we, we help them answer two questions. One, what is your why? You know, why, you know, not just what you do, but why you do it. And then two, we ask them, um, what would the world look like if you didn't exist? And would the world miss you? We start there. And actually there's a third question that we ask, which gets to every company has a mission statement, right? And you guys probably have, you know, dealt with and work with companies. Bala, you probably know what your mission statement is. We look at mission statements and oftentimes a thing that we see with mission statements is that it's very um, idealistic and it's very much as the world should be. And we ask, that mission statement is great, but what's getting in the way? What's mm -hmm. getting, what's the tension that's actually getting in the way? And then we go, are you actually uniquely equipped to take that tension on? And if you are, what tools do you have? And let's actually... Um, Let's build a platform around this. Let's actually have this be how you go to market to the outside world, how you speak to uh, investors, um, how it comes to light in the cu customer experience, and, and, and we help them in, the, in that, jar that journey, essentially. So if my mission is fluffy happiness, <laughs> how would you help me with you know, purpose-led brand development? <laughs> yeah, look, I think, I think we would say, um, first of all, we ask, is the mission true? Now the fluffy happy mission might actually be true. And if that's the case, we'll just build off that. We've actually done that with a couple of brands and we tweak the mission, but you know, we will say, is this, is this mission actually true? Um, and it's, it becomes le less of an issue. That's more foundational. Um, the fluffy thing comes next. So if it's true, but it's fluffy, then we, then we, then we identify the tension. Then we say very <laughs> gently, we say, yeah, your mission is not okay, wrong. I'm a, I'm a pillow company. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, we, you know, what we do is we challenge them to actually look to see if there's a, if there's a tension right. that's actually worth them taking on. And by the way, that tension becomes a brand building proposition. Yeah. You know, modern brands are now built upon, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, the, the, the value of your products and services, but again, like sort of, you know, your, your beliefs and your values. Something that I like to say is that it's no longer the value proposition, it's the values proposition. Well, that's interesting, right? Because we're, we're seeing this shift, right? I mean, before it was all about brand promise and purpose, right? Yes. And I'm seeing this bigger shift. And I think maybe it's saying it in a different way, but we're seeing people move from brand promises to activating movements, right? And, and a great example I use all the time, not because of Avala's on the show, but Trailhead is pretty interesting. You got 2 million users, half a million of these people don't even own Salesforce. I mean, that's activating a movement around something, right? And, and, and yeah. I'm seeing that happen in so many places where brands are making that shift shift, right, to get to movements, right? But they have to do it in the way that you're talking about, because otherwise they don't, they haven't identified the tension to be able to take action on that. Well, and, I, and, and yeah, David, go ahead, Mala. If you go to David's uh, Twitter, uh, at Armano, he has a pinned tweet. Yep. He kind of cap, it, it, it illustrates, it's, it's the then and now CMO, and he says, you know, the then CMO, it's about access, profit, advertising, and uh, ambivalence. The now CMO is experience, purpose, activating and activism. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that because yeah. I think in so little words, you actually very well captured uh, what, what the new expectations are in terms of doing well and doing good are not mutually exclusive. And I even animated that. 
You did. I made it. <laughs> oh, that's really, that's really. Let's take a look. I'm popping it up yeah, right now. Hey, take a look. You'll get a kick out of it. It's animated. It's uh, um, so. You know, look, I, I, I oversimplified it and it's a little, I, I'm not going to lie, it's a li it's definitely aspirational. Uh, I've even had people challenge me and say, you know, uh, hey, tell that to the board uh, if that it's not about profit. And, you know, fair point. But that doesn't take away from the fact that everything else that I said before is true, that consumers are looking for more and the expectations are higher and they will reward you. Like Nike got rewarded for taking a stance. They got rewarded Absolutely. monetarily. Now, they didn't, they didn't take that much risk, actually. They are a data-based company. And, oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Nice. <laughs> you know, so the whole thing with Kaepernick, yeah. that's amazing. I can't believe that. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so impressed. Um, so the thing about the Kaepernick deal and Nike was they, they know their customer base. They're actually a very data-driven company. So the risk wasn't as high. Um, as you would think, but what, what did it did? You guys talked about activism, you talked about advocates, you talked about that, you know, their values ignited their customers. They were like, oh yeah, I'm down with that. And I'm going to buy something just, I don't even need shoes. I'm going to buy an extra pair of Nike just because I believe in what you're saying and I believe in the stance that you're making, right? Yeah. So what it did was it activated people who already believe in those same values um, and it gave them an excuse to buy maybe when they didn't even have one. Wait, well, hey, you know, maybe maybe under maybe Under Armour should have then taken that advantage and then lit up the other group of people that were pissed, right? <laughs> and take out their brand the other way and have a full brand war. It would have been wild. <laughs> I, I, look, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be surprised if you actually do start seeing that because we do live in polarized times. Um, <laughs> but you know, Nike did it well. Um, they didn't do it perfectly, but. Another thing that's over, often overlooked about Nike is they did have a right to do it. You know, they are a socially progressive brand. They've done a lot of smaller things that actually have flown under the radar a little bit more. But if you look into it, like they do play in this space. They've hit, you know, they've done it in the campaigns. They've done it, um, you know, at the community level. So really, yeah, it was a big gesture. But actually, if you do look at Nike, they are a socially progressive brand. It, it, it is in line with their values. You can poke and probe and no company's perfect, but it's not like it really came out of nowhere. I was just surprised there's no reaction. Nobody came back after it, but we're going to see these cycles get faster and faster. Well, they did. People were burning their Nikes. There were, it did upset a number of people, but those, those right. were never going to be Nike customers, or if they were, they, they, they weren't the ones, they were the ones that Nike was willing to say, like, they're on the periphery. They're not our core, you know, customer group. Yeah. Very, very interesting. So, so let's talk about this other trend since we only got a few minutes left and you've been talking about this and advocating on this. What about gig workers? What's the state of the state of gig workers? I have been spending a lot of time talking about this and super, super good timing given the fact the Uber uh, IPOs today. So. Yeah, look, I think, um, I think all those companies actually, Airbnb, uh, Uber, Lyft, all of them are um, going to have, A, I think they're viable. I'm a little bit more bullish on them, Ray, than you, you were talking about earlier offline, but um, but they are going to have some challenges because um, they have a couple of forces that are actually working against them. There's a great piece, I think it was the Washington Post that actually talked about how uh, Uber's one of, one of the Uber's biggest challenges is the economy and stuff and the fact that it's doing well because Uber employees are like, we want more, we want, you know, we, we want benefits and actually you're in a tight labor market. Uh, one of the uh, sectors, we have a number of clients in QSR, they can't hire. No. Taco Bell's throwing hiring par parties, McDonald's looking to um, you know, retirees to actually hire. So that, that's, you know, Uber will be, you know, will be challenged there. They'll have to offer more um, and it's going to get more competitive. It's, it's, it's the, the company's a great experience. I mean, and we're all consumers, right? It's a great experience, but um, they're gonna probably have to pass on that cost um, and then on the other side, I think people are becoming more sensitive to the headlines. I think uh, there's a great book out. It, it, it's a little bit black and white in nature, but it's called uh, Winners Take All uh, mm -hmm. by Don Gerard Hardis. It is um, so spot on. Now he would take the position, he would take the opposite position. He was like, these societal issues can only be solved by systematic things like government. Like it takes systems to solve systems. And he makes a really good argument. I don't agree fully with a lot of the things, but he does take companies like Uber to task um, in terms of their policies, and he's not wrong. Like these companies will be challenged. And by the way, it's no accident that companies like Lyft have very flowery purpose statements, um, because in reality, some of the practices are, uh, you know, 
um, they need to do some work, right? Or, or, uh, or sometimes it's out of their control, like Airbnb. I don't know if you, you followed what they dealt with over the past couple of years um, with uh, profiling, uh, you know, happening with, uh, you know, it's a marketplace, right? They can't fully control the marketplace. And to their credit, they've been pretty aggressive in taking that on. But it goes to show you that, you know, they have a whole promise about opening up travel to everyone. And then in reality, they have an issue where people are actually practicing, um, you know, discri discriminatory, pra uh, discrimi I can't say the word. But you know, yeah. Redlining. Discriminatory practices, okay. and, right? So, so all these things are related to yeah. the more macro topic of belief-driven buying. What are your values? How do you communicate them? How do you bring them to life? And also, how do you live them? All related. David, this twenty minutes went way too fast. We could have spent an hour with you. Really, really <laughs> incredible insights. It is and, amazing. Uh, well, I, I have a conversation with a publisher next week. It may go nowhere, it may go somewhere, but I'll keep you guys. I'll keep you guys posted. This hey, is a, this a big topic, and I'm passionate about it. If that book comes in, let us know. We are here with David Armano, Global Strategy Director at Edelman. You can follow him at his awesome Twitter handle at Armano. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank thanks you both. It was so much fun. Thanks a lot. Happy Friday. Woohoo! Happy Friday. All right. We are got. That's amazing, yeah, I mean, dude. I mean, I've been talking to him for decades. <laughs> yeah, I've been following him for five, six years on Twitter, and he's really one of the brightest. When it comes to digital transformation, he's a deep thinker. And, uh, and speaking of deep thinker and other <laughs> incredible transformation agents, we're here with Sandy Lin, CEO and co-founder of Skilljar, the leading customer training platform. Skilljar is the leading customer training platform for enterprise to accelerate product adoption and increase customer retention. Sandy was just recognized as the top woman leader in SaaS for 2018. So congratulations, we wanna learn more about your leadership principles. Uh, prior to Skilljar, Sandy worked at Amazon and she's an incredible follow on Twitter as well, at S-A-N-D-I-S-L-I-N. Welcome Sandy to Disrupt TV. Thank you. Happy Friday. Thanks for being on the show. I mean, you're hitting a point that's so important. A lot of folks are worried about what's next, how to be skilled, how to get training, what's happening. And you're talking about customer training. So why is customer training vital for enterprises today? Yeah, great question. So have you heard the term shelfware? It's one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite words because it just conjures up this image of shrink wrap software that's just sitting on a shelf somewhere. Um, Shelfware is dead. We are living in a subscription world in many respects, certainly at the consumer level. When you blow this out to the enterprise, it's true as well. Um, users have choices, companies have choices in ways that they really didn't five, 10 years ago. Um, and so it's really critical for companies to not just close that initial sale, but also proactively, continuously enable their end users so that they can get the most out of the product and use it to its fullest extent. And customer training is the best way to do that. Um, I sometimes talk about closing the gap between closed one and the support ticket. Um, and, and training is the proactive way to do that. Yeah, I mean, when, when I think about just over time, you know, the use of features and functions uh, with customers and the capabilities that SaaS provides, that consumption gap keeps growing over time, which means that customers are not getting the best benefit of the features and benefits that are being developed and delivered to them. And also on the customer side, you lose that stickiness. Uh, because the more features and functions that are enabled, uh, not only is advantageous to the customer, but also to the provider. So, so what are some of the best practices maybe in, in B2B companies where, where they're leveraging your technology, your platform to really reduce that consumption gap and get the most out of the, you know, the, the, the SaaS solution that's being delivered to their customers? Yeah, so I would say first, it actually starts pre-sales. And in fact, a couple of our customers organize customer training and education into their marketing team because it's all about industry enablement, sort of that pre-sales education. And I'm not just talking about an ebook with a catchy clickbait you know, title and you click on an ad and you get an email and then you get SDR'd the heck out of like <laughs> the whole day. I'm talking about real valuable content and in some cases, our customers actually issue continuing education credits if it's a licensed industry. So, you know, really thoughtful um, uh, educational content to really just help the industry. We see it a lot in like open source technologies as well as when there's literally no other way to learn this information except from the vendors 
Um, second, I would say uh, training really for most effectiveness needs to have some component that's on demand and continuous. And so in a high tech world, this may seem obvious, but 80% of customer education is still done offline actually, and instructors flying around the world, tens of thousands of dollars a day, sort of classroom-based education. Um, and most of us uh, like to consume you know, bite-sized content, like reading a book, you just read a chapter a day. Um, and not everybody can attend onboarding sessions or live instruction. And so being able to have a self-paced option 24 seven and what I call re-onboarding because companies think about uh, initial implementation and training of an account, but the reality is most of the users turn over um, within two years anyway. And so new features, as you said, new people coming on board, how are you going to serve all of those users continuously and being self-paced is part of that. Um, and the third I would say is data, the um, being able to connect training with uh, other systems, you know, Skillter, for example, we're on Salesforce App Exchange, and so being able to tie uh, training and certification activity back to, um, you know, customer engagement, customer health, and ultimately account retention and expansion is super critical. Um, and then I, the last one is just uh, being really thinking about user experience. Now, most of us, you know, I've worked at Amazon. And when I think about taking our internal training, um, you know, it's not something that you would ever like, <laughs> inflict on your external customers if you could help it. And so, you know, user experience matters. The customers need to be able to find what they're looking for quickly, you know, as few clicks as possible, shouldn't require internet explorer pop-ups. Um, you know, one of our earliest customers were like, it just needs to work in Chrome. It just needs to work in Chrome. But, you know, many systems don't even have that in our industry. So um, user experience matters. You know, it's a great question. You know, you get a customer, they're all excited, they're happy. They just made the purchase decision, they bought it, and then you lose them, right? So what do you have to do 30, 60, 90 days in to get people excited, happy, engaged, so that you don't lose them, especially in these subscription economies where churn becomes the big issue, right? Everything's all about MAUs and ARPU and churn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, so much of the dialogue around customer and success and churn is just around the mechanics of the renewal or like, um, but I say it's kind of like you're trying to avoid a divorce with the last minute attempt at therapy. <laughs> but what you should have been doing is working in that relationship. Well, you want the divorce and you got the tip just as a backup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're trying to find like recommendations for therapists and, but it's all about, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, you know, working on building that healthy relationship, which is much harder for a company. So as you said, right, that those first 90 days are critical. Like your, your customer will never be more excited than when they first finally, you know, got through procurement and they're all ready to implement. And um, the, uh, so I mean, I know at Skillshare, we have a very sort of high touch implementation process. It's sort of scripted out week by week. We understand those aha moments from a product education perspective. Um, uh, we look at uh, product usage as well, and we really outline the tasks that are needed for users to get value from the product in the first 90 days. And sometimes it's not full launch. We've set up milestones around content loading, um, soft launch, um, because a lot of more complex products, it is a staged, uh, a staged process. And if you're not seeing those users complete those tasks or achieve those milestones, then that should be a big um, mm, red flag. That's a flag. That's a yeah. flag. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, in my experience, successful companies do purposefully work to ensure the marriage experience is better than the courtship <laughs> experience. And, uh, and often they do that through education. Um, I've had CIOs tell me directly that adoption is the new ROI. So that's how they're getting oh, I like that. in terms of their investment thesis, uh, knowing that there are no IT projects, there are only business projects. So if you're going to invest in a technology, it better be uh, aligned to the strategy and purpose of the business and whether it's revenue EBITDA you know customer experience compliance whatever the catalyst is for the for the for the for the spending so so how do companies uh, or what are some of the KPI key performance indicators or metrics to measure you know happiness and loyalty with a customer it, you see SAT as a traditional one some speak to net promoter score but other other metrics that really speak to um, loyalty and, and happiness? Yes, so great question. And I was gonna say NPS and CSAT are the obvious ones, but I actually personally don't like either of them because mm -hmm. they are lagging indicators and yeah. like, uh, and you can't like, 
MPS your customers all the time. Um, and, uh, and it's all relative and it's just that you can benchmark against other companies, but um, it is what it is. So this is an area that I think that our industry in post-sale customer success needs to do work on. And I would say our best customers that are most progressive have been able to actually quantify the value of training. And the best ones have even gone to say, if you, if there's three education activities and a user, then they are, they've actually quantified the dollar value that that means to their organization in terms of either increased usage or account expansion, depending on the business model. Um, and I think it's very similar, I imagine, to how marketing used to be, where marketing used to be this kind of blue pen, back of the office, like brand thing. And then over time, companies have gotten down to, I mean, let's take in B2B, a lot of companies say $100 per MQL. Like literally they're willing to pay $100 for a form fill email address that meets some criteria. Um, now imagine how much they might be willing to pay for an engaged customer that voluntarily is taking an hour of training on how to use that product better. Well, like I can tell you that for a lot of our customers that works out to something like a dollar. Um, which that ROI on that, as you said, is crazy. But I think we're still in the infancy of really trying to understand how to um, tie those post-sale activities to retention. I mean, it's not just training. What about attending a customer conference? How much is that worth to a company for that user and for that account? Um, there's a lot of ways of quantifying these uh, customer journey metrics that I hope we can apply some of the lessons from the pre-sales journey. You know, that's a great point, right? I mean, as we're applying things like AI and other factors in here, um, the training aspect is only one pillar of, of how you keep a customer engaged, right? And, and being able to understand if preferences have changed through surveys or uh, needs have changed, uh, getting that built into the training might also give you some other indicators that might be even more valuable as you go from an MQL to SQL conversion, which is mm -hmm. just pretty cool uh, to watch. So, so how does CXM then, customer experience management, play in this transformation journey for you guys in terms of what you're doing? Yeah, I love this topic because I think in the consumer world, CXM has been such like a front of mind topic for so long. And in the B2B world, like companies are still trying to figure out what it means because, you know, let's take Nordstrom. You're churning out of Nordstrom every time you walk out the door. Um, what does it mean from a B2B perspective and how do companies think about it? So, um, so for subscription-based companies, which is sooner or later going to be everybody, everybody. customers are your biggest ass asset and making them successful then becomes the pillar to long-term success. So it's all about those proactive investments and customer experience. And then how does that impact product adoption, revenue renewals, and upsells? So I, the most effective companies, and we see this in some of our customers, it's a collaboration. It's across product marketing, customer marketing, customer success, product management, finance, um, and the thoughtfulness of this digital transformation, and it's got to come from the top, can directly accelerate time to value for customers and increase product adoption and, and thus um, revenue. But I've also seen companies fail because it could be like the hot thing, but they're really you know, treating it as a reactionary topic versus being truly like a commitment from the C-level and the board to become a customer-focused organization. That's amazing. You know, last week I was reflecting on um, the 26th year anniversary of the web. Uh, the web was launched by CERN, uh, the particle physics lab, in uh, April 30th, I believe, 1993. And, uh, you know, they made, the, made it available publicly for free, with free licensing. A year later, Jeff Bezos launched Amazon, uh, five years ahead of Google, six years ahead of Alibaba. So clearly, Jeff saw the power of the internet as perhaps the most disruptive technology for the next hundred years. And you worked at Amazon and, you know, again, a company that understands the new currencies in a digital economy, speed, personalization at scale, intelligence. So as you're thinking about training customers where you can let them lean into technology more to grow their market share, and you see another disruptive force, AI, some argue it could be the most impactful technology in the next hundred years, and even bigger than the impact of internet. How does that uh, machine learning, natural language processing, neural networks, deep learning, all these sciences that make up AI impact. We just talked about, you know, by the way, for all the acronym people, while MQL is marketing qualified, the SQL sales qualified. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> not, I'm not sure everybody's as fluent as you two when it comes to acronyms. Uh, so how does the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, on, on your business and future of customer enablement? Yeah, it's a good question because my co-founder actually built uh, machine learning into Amazon's personalization engine way back when. Um, and there's so much potential because AI can take you know, huge sets of data and deliver real-time insights and, and sort of learn on its own more than humans can. But I think it's going to be really challenging in the B2B world because there just simply isn't enough data for most companies mm. and, and touch points to, to derive anything meaningful. Now in the consumer world, let's take Amazon. I mean, Amazon is everything about you through, I mean, uh, you know, the things that you buy. And, and I don't know whether they, I've been out for six years to be clear, but like even your purchase intent versus um, the things you click on versus maybe what you're talking to Alexa about versus your usage of Amazon Web Services versus your usage of Zappos. There's so many like interactions that we um, uh, do with, with companies as a consumer that, and across, you know, hundreds of millions of, of people that there's opportunities to do really cool things and draw patterns automatically. And the B2B side, like, I just don't know that um, there's enough data for most companies that are not Salesforce, maybe to draw huge conclusions, because like, even in our, in our business, when we, um, we hear from our customers that they don't even know who their customers are in Salesforce, which is like a little weird, right? They, they'll close an account, they'll have the, let's say, five to 10 stakeholders that actually executed the contract. And then they're like, we don't actually know who to send training to because it's a whole different set of people. And so, and, and that person may only engage with the product or the, or the company, you know, at most, you know, a couple times a day. So we're talking about, you know, hundreds or thousands of data points versus millions of data points, which is really hard to, to kind of train any kind of AI on. So um, there will be some exceptions. I think there's some big B2B companies that do have, you know, an interesting data pool in, in which to, to do cool things, but I don't know that it's going to be as meaningful for like the average B2B company. Do you, do you think we may get to a point where if you simply had a histogram of companies uh, as, and, and their growth trajectories, where in the upper right quadrant, you have the fastest growing companies in the lower quadrant, you have the lowest, and it could be just, let's say revenue or, or, or percent market share gain, whatever the, whatever the key uh, 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 KPI. And, and then you look at those companies that are growing really fast and you try to find uh, a correlation engine that says which, which features and function are enabled and common for that population, and that guides your training priority. So you say, for example, that uh, social listening is a common capability for all these high growth companies. So we're gonna train you on that first. Is there a way where machine learning, because it can make decisions on thousands of different data points, you can have a prioritized list of training based on growth? Maybe. I'm a little like garbage in, garbage out where, you know, there's a lot of smart professors that already look at this types of data, but there's only so much available that you can get from public statements and it doesn't really tell you how to implement. So for example, like in sales, it turns out the more accounts you contact, the more meetings you can generate and the more opportunities and revenue. So so law of numbers applies. So law of numbers applies. Mm -hmm. and, and then everything's so situational, like especially in a startup like we are here today, there's so many sort of interesting overlaps and gaps of skills and talents that's unique to the set of people here that it's hard to say, rinse and repeat in a particular situation or industries that transferable. So, I mean, maybe there's, I don't know that much about the public markets and the quant world of, and I'm sure there's, you know, cool things there, but from an operational perspective, I'm, I don't totally see how to apply that to you know, a particular like one-off case because um, as they say, entrepreneurs, it's not a portfolio game. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're all not allowed in. to, you're, they didn't bet on you. Yeah, yeah your, your beta is high or alpha, I forget which one it is, but it, you're all in on that one. So. Yeah. Your, your beta is high and your alpha is high too. But yeah, anyway, and, then that's, that's and, the, and then I would also say like, there's some negative consequences, right? I'm a woman founder. Like if you, if you did the patterns of public tech companies, like there's, probably very few women founders there. So that would tell me like, oh, they should change me out, right? So I don't yeah. know. Oh, let's not do that. Hey, but let's, I'm just, I'm talk, just about, saying, let's talk about the startup that. scene. But let's talk about the startup scene. Okay. You're backed by Mayfield, you're backed by Shasta, you're backed by Trilogy, you're hiring, you've got a pet to human ratio, almost <laughs> one to one. Uh, tell me more, how, did, how, do you start a how do you start a company? Uh, how did you start it? And 
Why Seattle? Why did you, because otherwise, other than you being in, in your Amazon, but, but what would yeah. you want to do this real quick? Well, it's you funny. Know. I moved to Seattle in 2008, almost because like, I thought I'd be in the Bay Area for the rest of my life. So I was going to grad school at Stanford and I just fell in love with the city. I mean, and so is everybody in the Bay Area now, by the way, but i um, a great quality of life, great weather, um, great tech scene, great culture. And so um, I decided only to- only recruits May and June, just so people know that. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's 80 degrees and sunny today. And I think I, think I said that. So you know, I had a great run at Amazon, um, got to work on two cool startups within the company. One was um, fulfillment by Amazon and the third party side and then Amazon Local, which was our sort of daily deal business that later evolved into Prime Now. Um, and But I'd always just really wanted to start a company. My dad was an entrepreneur. And one of the pain points I saw was in marketplace and, and also in the local deals business, just being able to onboard sellers at scale. Like the world is not self-service. Like, I'm sorry, if you're, if you're like, I don't know, buying Netflix, that's self-service, but learning how to sell products effectively in Amazon, um, that's not like something that an average person just can click through three workflows and, and do well. And so um, being able to create this platform for, to like facilitate learning, especially back in 2013, when like great companies like Coursera and lynda.com, like all this cool video instruction was coming online, that was really exciting to me. And so um, over time, we got increasing demand from much larger customers. Um, and so we just kind of pivoted really to mid-market and enterprise three years ago and have leaned into that. Well, we're here with Sandy Lynn, CEO and co-founder at Skilljar. Uh, thanks for being on here. You can follow her on Twitter at S-A-N-D-I-S-L-I-N. So thanks for being on the show and happy Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Wow. What, a, what an amazing CEO. Lot to learn. And, uh, you know, investing in training, investing in your people is, um, is, uh, is, is uh, incredibly important. Um, the digital divide will continue to expand if you're not investing in, in training and investing in data, which... Uh, uh, leads to our, 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 uh, our amazing final guest, Doug Henshin, Vice President, Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, focusing on data-driven decision-making. Absolutely the most important thing on top of mind of all CXOs. Doug, Data to Decision Research examines how organizations employ data analysis to reimagine their business model, not just modernizing existing processes, business models, and to gain a deep, uh, better understanding of their customers, which is the most important thing. Right now, insights-driven business models are of our interest of all CXOs, starting with the CEO. This is becoming a boardroom topic. You can follow Doug on Twitter at D-H-E-N-S-C-H-E-N. Welcome back, Doug, to Disrupt TV. Givala, and SQL is structured query language, not anything about qualified leads. Darn. All yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, depends on context, as Doug would say. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, Doug, we've been talking about data decisions since you joined Constellation. What's four new? years ago? Four years ago. What's new? What's shifted? And why have we shifted so much? What's going on? Well, um, it's hard to call it entirely new, but we've been talking about AI for for two years now. I think what's shifted is our, our bar of what we call artificial intelligence. You know, really what, what is narrow uh, artificial intelligence is what we're talking about today. Machine learning, deep learning, natural language understanding, knitting it together with some, with some automation. But people are excited about it. Um, you know, they, they see the consumer products. They see the home uh, digital assistants. They love to see this in their software. And uh, this week we heard a lot about natural language going to the next generation with the, you know, conversational user interfaces. So at Build, Satya Nadella was talking about a conversational canvas and at Google I.O., Sanya, uh, Sanjay Pichai talking about Google Duplex. It's really adding more context, adding more data to that interaction. So it's not this repetitive, simple questions. You get more of an interplay. You use the graph of your interactions with email and calendar and search and all this stuff. And, and address what they started to call multi-turn conversations, multi-agent interactions. So we're gonna have many more Alexas. They're gonna be specialized and trained for in-depth processes in the business. Um, it'll be able to follow conversations and generate questions along the way to kind of clarify and understand the intent. So, so this week we, we heard uh, an Amazon Go store that opened up in New York City. And when I think about the flow dynamics that 
perhaps govern the design thinking principles for the go store is that you know you walk in you pick up you walk out and you've got this continuous flow where you recognize that every time you stop, every time you introduce friction into the process, you're actually degrading the customer experience. So as you think about data to decision-making flow, are we trying to apply AI in the most frictionless model where it's not tapping, swiping, typing, you're actually just talking and maybe in the future you're just thinking, because we saw an MIT student last year just thinking and surfing the web, where all of this is really fundamentally flow-based customer experience design principles and the data to decision-making in real time that actually identifies engagement opportunities, the less frictionless it becomes, the more adaptive, agile, and, 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 and a higher performance in, 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 in an enterprise. Well, absolutely. It's all about gathering more context to understand what's going on. And, you know, at, at the top of the list is that human interactive interface. Also, you know, facial recognition, mood recognition, um, all of these cues add context to an interaction and eliminated fr and friction is absolutely the goal. We're moving away from these rigid rules, um, rigid pre-canned questions and pre-canned processes. People break out of this stuff all the time. I was at the, an IPsoft event this week. They, they help with a lot of uh, companies with their, with their call center operations and moving on from the first generation IVR where you're trapped in a flow and you can't break out of it. And what they're bringing to it is, yeah, they're bringing the AI to understand, well, this person is way over here in the process. Let's skip all those steps and bring them here. That's where they need to be. And it, also, it does that by picking up on their cues. I also uh, read this week, was it this week? Yeah, so some of these IVR systems uh, based on tone sentiment analysis are trying to best match the service agent to the customer, knowing, oh, totally. knowing that if there is uh, common characteristics uh, that will improve the flow. Um, and it's not just- Absolutely. And I would, I would doubt that would be an IVR system though. That is a more intelligent system. If it's able to do that, it might be using machine learning pattern detection to see that people that start with this question or pursuing this, and it's quickly picking up as maybe a new product emerges or there's a change in firmware or something right. where suddenly a service issue emerges and it has to quickly learn from what's changing in the environment. So absolutely. Wow. Hey, you've been traveling a lot at different events. You just referenced a couple that you went to this week and a few last week, and it's been we're high in event season. What's up with everyone becoming an intelligent enterprise? I mean, were we not <laughs> before? Or uh, what's with this like, yeah, we're hearing it marketing everywhere. So what's, what's going on there? Well, uh, I'm very flattered because I was editor of Intelligent Enterprise Magazine from 2004 until 2010. <laughs> so we were ahead of our time, way ahead of our time. You know, I think the concept back then as now is really harnessing your data, breaking down the silos of information, breaking down the silos of processes, integrating all these things to get to smarter decisions. Now, 15 years ago, we were really at the, the dawn of big data. Uh, you know, unstructured data was searchable, but it wasn't really something you could, you could analyze and glean trends from. Today, all of that is assumed. We're going to have access to data at scale. We're going to have access to unstructured information and be able to mine it. Um, but we want to, you know, take that information now and get to, to some recommendations or some actions or even automated actions. And we want to do it in, in near real time, if not real time. Um, we're also mining much more in the way of uh, behavioral information. I wasn't there, but I was watching the stream of uh, Sapphire uh, and, uh, you know, the big conversation about X's and O's, uh, taking the customer experience data as well as the operational data, the ERP system, blending them together and understanding, uh, you know, customer and employee, you know, human behavior better and being able to intuit and recommend better. And you know this uh, customer data. We're seeing this emergence of customer data platforms. It's kind of to me like the shiny new thing. Uh, it doesn't have any baggage at this point. Uh, you know, I would remind uh, I remind our our buy side clients that data warehouses and data lakes were once new too. 
Uh, so you, you really have to have a clear information strategy to avoid overlaps. I think the, the vendors that are proposing these new customer data platforms have to say more about, okay, well, how do I rationalize this with my lake, with my warehouse, and uh, you know, avoid yet more technical debt? We had John Reed on the show last week, and we went through a, a buzzword bingo uh, session with him based on all the events that he's been to. I recall, you know, Ray being at Davos last year, and there was a race between blockchain and AI in terms of the most dominant uh, technologies, people talking about distributed ledgers and machine learning. And so far, halfway through this year, what do you think will define 2019? When we exit this year, based on the events you've been to, what is really top of mind? Uh, and maybe it's not technology, maybe it's c customer experience and then the discussion goes deeper into how do we enable a beautiful experience. But what do you think will define 2019 um, in, in the space that, that you're, you're focusing data decision market? Well, I, I think in the area of machine learning and AI, we're seeing a real maturation. We're going from the very handcrafted approaches, artisanal approaches of the past, mm -hmm to sort of an industrialized, uh, scaled up approach. Uh, anybody in AI and deep learning is talking about this, uh, adopting sort of a DevOps uh, uh, mentality or approach to, to building models. And now people need to build these at scale. I did a case study earlier this year about Climate Corp and they have a precision agriculture app that um, for, for farmers to, it tells them you know, when to plant, where to plant, which specific hybrid variety of seed, how deep to plant the seeds, how far apart in the rows, when to fertilize, when to uh, water, when to harvest. Uh, so they need something in, in excess of 200 models in production to dry this. And oh, by the way, all this stuff is on a mobile app it's linked with tractors and guides these actions. It's actually driving the tractor through the fields wow. and set, resetting all these measures on the implements to execute on that plan. Uh, and it's all driven by historical crop yield data, uh, uh, soil information, up to, up to the minute uh, climate and weather data. Uh, so very sophisticated. So you, you can't, get to that level of predictive uh, forecasting without really bringing it to a production scale. There aren't enough uh, engine, data engineers and data scientists to, to make that machine run fast enough without automation and without something like a DevOps style approach. You know, that's a great point. And, that, and that's happening this year. So I, I think it's really, it's really maturing in 2019. That's a great point. What else is on your astro chart? And for folks that don't know what the astro chart is, it's where Constellation takes the time to plot out the future and trends. Every analyst has their astro chart looking at their business area. And we look at, you know, uh, impact on the business and level of adoption that's in the market. What's hot on your astro chart, Doug? Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, looks into augmented analytics. Uh, it's interesting conversation. I tend to hear this from the analytics vendors. Uh, but this week I was at a more automation oriented event, the IPsoft event I mentioned, and there's um, a totally different focus where augmented is about helping people in their current job. The folks that are more focused on automation are talking more about retraining, upskilling, uh, raising, uh, uh, freeing the workers to handle more creative tasks. So. I mean, at this event, there were big companies like Allstate and Bank of America and MetLife and McKesson. And these you know, call center executives are measured by productivity. And they're saying, yeah, I reduced you know, 880,000 uh, man hours this year. I'm going to reduce another 100,000 next year. So you know, I, I think it's the orientation of the vendors. You know, with Some of these vendors that talk about augmentation, oh, by the way, they sell by the seat. <laughs> and those that are measured by how much they can automate, they're, they're measured and licensed by how much money they can save. And uh, that, that dyna dynamic might change a little. The other thing, I'm um, working on a piece of research right now on embedded analytics. This is the idea as we get to um, lower latency demands that we don't have time to go off to a report or we don't have time to go off to a dashboard. 
we want those analytics embedded right into the applications. And, you know, Lyft and Uber, you guys were talking about earlier, Lyft and Uber are analytic applications. You know, you, you, it tells you when your vehicle is, it's predicting when the vehicle will arrive, when, it, and to pick you up, when it will arrive at its final destination. When traffic comes up, it's dynamically changing those predictions. Uh, when it reroutes, more analytics to tell you, uh, you know, how long it's gonna take, uh, when you will arrive, how much it's gonna cost, et cetera, et cetera. That is an analytic app. And uh, we're gonna see many more examples of this as more, more companies, I don't believe that every company will become a software company, certainly not the, the laggards and the cautious adopters, but the pioneers and the leaders we're seeing out there are definitely starting to build their own software, starting to build their own data-driven services, and the analytics will need to be built in and embedded within the app. Embedded has tended to be talked about as an ISV thing. Right. You know, uh, ISVs, software providers are taking the analytic engines and burying them in their software. But I think, you know, enterprises and, and companies that aren't in the software business are going to be doing this as well. Sure. You know, we, we, we just read about uh, Amazon's uh, sophisticated uh, uh, um, analytics about warehouse employee productivity measures. Um, so much so that the algorithm recommends whether the employee is a good fit for Amazon or not. And you wrote a, a recently an article about Workday's developing uh, machine learning and graph processing capabilities that can be leveraged across companies' applications. Can you talk about how this data decision-making world of human capital and, and how where you see progress in terms of having advanced analytics that measure, uh, you know, the happiness, the engagement level and the productivity of employees and what that means in terms of balancing that with potential creepiness of the whole thing, <laughs> with, <laughs> with privacy and, 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 uh, and, and, and security come into play. Yeah, you, de you definitely have to have a different attitude, whether it's inside or outside. I mean, Sandy was talking about using the telemetry of customers and how yeah. they're interacting with their software. That's the same sort of pattern. Um, and whether you want to have that with your employees or your customers, obviously with customers these days, you know, you have to do the opt-in, you have to, oh, by the way, there's a, we're putting a cookie on, on yeah. your browser. Um, you know, you just have to do it the right way. I think it, it's being done responsibly, but you know, beh behavioral data is, is uh, where it's at. Um, you know, Holger is more the HCM guy, but absolutely we can see the productivity of, of employees. It's, it's uh, even be, before machine learning and, and these latest techniques were applied, you know, any call center operation, any high volume operation was using metrics and measures yeah. to determine the productivity of employees. I, I actually, one of my first jobs out of college, I worked in a, uh, like a call center, a boutique call center for, uh, uh, you know, a couple of months and it, there was a complete ratio and, you know, number of total calls. I mean, all those measures were there. Wow. They weren't as sophisticated, but, you know, all the measures were there and hand filled out reports at the end of each shift, you know, told the story of who was most productive. Yeah, so, no, I ran call centers for 10 years. I'm very, very <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. um, I just talked to all about call centers. Uh, so, so, Doug, what's hot? What are you doing in the next couple of weeks, uh, taking us out to the end of June? Any interesting events that are on your uh, schedule, uh, places you're speaking, webinars that are going on? Uh, next week, I am going to click Connections, uh, and that is in Orlando, I believe. No, I'm sorry. It's Dallas. Dallas, Dallas second time. I was, we were there together uh, for the SAS event a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Um, and then the following week, I am in Vegas uh, speaking at uh, the, the Host Perform conference. And then in, uh, in June, I'm off to an Oracle Analytics meeting at the Sky Ranch, where I've, a Skywalker Ranch, where I've never been. So that should be fun. And... Um, I'm sure I've got more on the agenda. I, I just go week to week. I haven't learned race trick in these four years of cloning myself. Uh, so. Hey, Augmented Humanity Works. I am proof of that. Living the life, Doug Henshan. You can follow him at D-H-E-N-S-C-H-E-N -E -E on Twitter. More importantly, he's our Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research. Thanks a lot for being on the show this week. Happy Friday. All right. Thank Have a great weekend, everyone. You're terrific. You know, uh, Ray, you, I, I now know the secret to your success. 
you surround yourself with super smart people. So, so yeah, yeah. So it's it, Doug was Doug was terrific. Um, next week uh, on our show, uh, another episode one forty nine. Episode one forty nine. We're getting very close, I believe, to four hundred unique guests on Disrupt TV. We'll let you know when we hit that milestone. We have Robert Scoble, Chief Strategy Officer at Infinite Retina, founder of Scobalizer. Again, anybody who knows, he's maybe the original evangelist uh, when it comes to technology and early adopter of, of, uh, of disruptive, disruptive tech. We have Safi Bakal, second generation physicist and author of Moonshots on our show. We'll be talking about his book. And we have one of our favorite guests, uh, uh, Ron Miller, enterprise reporter at TechCrunch. So he'll bring, uh, you know, some latest industry news uh, combined with our practitioners and thought leaders that we have on the show. So an amazing show, episode 49. Ray, final comments uh, for our audience. No, I'm getting excited. It's that time of year where we start picking the business transformation 150. So Di and I are calling through lists, nominations, trying to figure out who the top 150 transformation folks are in business. Uh, and that's coming up. We also have our Supernova Awards, right? So if you know people are doing cool projects, groups or individuals, they can nominate for that. Finalists get a free trip out to, we, I, I think it's a free trip. I've ever double check. Yeah, yeah. You get a free trip out to Half Moon Bay for a Constellation Connected Enterprise event, November 4th through 7th. Uh, so that time of year is getting really exciting. And then a lot of interesting feedback on the, on the blog post I wrote about the, about the, uh, about this digital duopolies and data-driven digital networks, a voice in my ear. Aubrey's saying, not a free trip. You get registration, you get career <laughs> now. Okay, so but you, get, you get invited to this awesome event where we do every year. It's our ninth year. Special guests include Tom Peters, Annie McCoo, Alan Batro, mm -hmm. and of course, we may have a four-star general, but we can't tell you who yet. So <laughs> that's kind of it. And John Hagel. And John Amazing. Hagel. Coming Amazing back. lineup. As someone who's attended the last five years of Constellation Connect Enterprise, it's, it's a must attend conference. I don't miss it. I just, the only thing is, I don't understand why co-host of one of the most influential technology podcasts can't be a, a candidate for Supernova Award, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> but we'll have you as a host. We'll have you back on stage. Of course, well. So, hey, thanks everybody. It is episode 148. This is Disrupt TV, 11 a.m. Pacific. What, is it one Eastern? Two Eastern. Two. Two Eastern every Friday. So thanks for being on the show. See you, everyone. See you Friday. Bye-bye. All right, bye.